One of the most significant figures of the 20th century in American politics and probably the pioneer of modern day whistleblowing, Daniel Ellsberg, died today at the age of 92. There you see the New York Times headline that reads, Danny Ellsberg, who leaked the Pentagon Papers, is dead at 92. The New York Times has a particular relationship with Ellsberg because it was that paper that he chose to leak those documents to back in 1971. And it was that paper that then began publishing them and reporting on them, even risked prosecution on the part of their editors to do so, and then fought the Nixon administration all the way to the Supreme Court, where they secured one of the most important press freedom victories in the history of the Supreme Court. And I want to take some time to walk through what it is that exactly that Daniel Ellsberg did, both in the Pentagon Papers case, but also for decades after that and the work that he did, because he is not only such an important figure in terms of modern American political history, but because the values he exemplifies are very much worth taking note of, in part because of how rare they are, but also the causes that led him to take this extraordinary decision to risk life in prison in order to make his fellow citizens aware about the systemic lying the U.S. government was doing to them about a war in Vietnam that was not fought with a volunteer army, but with a conscript army. Americans were being drafted by the tens of thousands. Young men were being sent off to the jungles of Vietnam to fight and die in a war, the purpose of which became increasingly unclear as each and every year went by. And yet Ellsberg had in his hands the truth about what the government was saying and doing. And the only way he could make that truth known is by undertaking a decision that far more likely than not would have sent him to prison for decades, if not life. And he chose to take that decision to undertake that act of self-sacrifice purely as an act of conscience. And again, that act by itself merits some reflection upon his death, but it's also the case that within that controversy, one finds many lessons that have direct application to our political controversies of today. Now, about two or three weeks ago, when it became clear that Ellsberg's cancer was growing and that he had a matter of weeks and not even months left to live. I was approached by the editor-in-chief of Rolling Stone, who asked me if I would write, not necessarily an obituary, but a kind of reflection on what Ellsberg meant to me as a journalist and as a citizen, as a defender of press freedom, as someone who was fortunate enough to be able to get to know Ellsberg and work alongside him. And I said that I would, and that's, that article was published earlier this afternoon, which I encourage you to read. It's, the title of it is, We're Told Never to Meet Our Childhood Heroes, Knowing Daniel Ellsberg Proved That Wrong. And essentially, it describes the fact that there's that old aphorism, that kind of cliche, the attribution of which is impossible to trace, that says, essentially, never meet your childhood heroes because they are sure to disappoint you. And it's advice that makes intuitive sense because usually when someone is turned into an icon or a hero the way Daniel Ellsberg was, human beings are far too complex and saddled with too many flaws in order to make that hero image sustained through interpersonal scrutiny and interaction. It usually results in great amounts of disappointment. And yet I wrote about the fact, and it really is true, that the more I got to know Daniel Ellsberg, the more that I worked with him, I, my respect for him only grew. It was just one of those amazing episodes where somebody about whom you have all kinds of positive perceptions because you studied them in childhood. They were this kind of imposing figure for me. He was when I was 11 and 12 and 13 and started becoming obsessed with the, whistle, with the Pentagon Papers case and Watergate years after it happened. I was too young when it happened to really pay attention to it, but it was years later when I did. It's very rare that somebody that you meet uh, actually ends up not only fulfilling your expectations and hopes for who they are, but expanding it and having respect for that person grow. And that's exactly what happened. I was able to meet Daniel Ellsberg in 2008 for the first time in Washington. And I remember being very nervous when I met him, uh, kind of almost like a teenager meeting their pop idol. 
And I remember so vividly, as though it were yesterday, that when I kept telling him that I regarded him as heroic, he not only was embarrassed by it, he didn't use this kind of costume of false humility, but he insisted that he wasn't a hero and that the reason for his view that he wasn't a hero was the fact that he regretted deeply what he did. And he didn't regret the fact at all that he leaked documents that had been designated top secret and almost went to prison for it. He regarded that as the most important decision of the part of his life that was public about his work. The thing he regretted was that he didn't do it earlier, that it took him some time to find the courage and that as he was searching for that courage, Americans were being sent off to the war in Vietnam to fight and die in a war that was based on lies from the very beginning but also that there were Vietnamese that were being killed. The exact number of Vietnamese civilians who were killed in that war is difficult to know, but it's certainly in the millions. And while you can quibble with this death or that as to whether it was the fault of the North Vietnamese or whomever, we were the invading country, just like we were in Iraq. And we had no business having our military in Vietnam. I interviewed RFK Jr. Uh, a few days ago, whose, thought, whose uncle was president at the time when advisors were first sent. And you, if you listen to that interview, heard him describe that he sent advisors under a lot of pressure. There were 16,000 advisors that ended up being sent during the term of his presidency. But according to RFK Jr., and there are reports to confirm this, John Kennedy, his uncle, the president at the time, started to become extremely disenchanted, felt that he had been lied to by the CIA and about the U.S. security state and by the Pentagon, that far more Americans were being killed as a result of the deployment of those advisors, and he therefore ordered all American personnel to be withdrawn by the end of 1965. A month after he issued that order, he was assassinated. His vice president, Lyndon Johnson, was inaugurated. Lyndon Johnson immediately ordered, or shortly thereafter, ordered troops to be deployed to Vietnam, combat troops, and from there the war rapidly escalated and didn't end for a decade or so later after many, many deaths. Now, what is so interesting to me about Daniel Osberg, and I talked a little bit about this when I interviewed Jeffrey Sachs, the former World Bank economist who had been at the center of a lot of institutions of American power and now has become an outspoken dissident of American uh, the American consensus and American pieties on foreign policy and economic policy, because usually dissidents are people who start off outside of the circles of establishment power and therefore begin as critics of it, and they fight against it, and they fight against it, and they live their lives as dissidents. It's very rare for someone who is completely embedded within establishment power to purposely remove themselves from it and make themselves an enemy of it. And that's true for a lot of reasons. To begin with, there are a lot of benefits to being an insider of establishment power. You have access to all kinds of secrets. You become very influential. The esteem that is derived from that when you are someone who's very well regarded in establishment circles translates into all sorts of societal approval and material success. So somebody who makes it into establishment circles rarely removes themselves deliberately. Sometimes they're expelled, but they rarely make themselves an enemy. And the other reason for that is the converse, which is while there are a lot of benefits to being an establishment insider, there are all kinds of costs to making yourself an enemy of the establishment. And people who end up inside the establishment know that better than anybody because they understand how the game is played. They realize the power wielded by the establishment. I always go back to that remarkable moment of unintended candor when Chuck Schumer, who's been around Washington forever as a member of the House and then the Senate, went on to Rachel Maddow's program days before Donald Trump was inaugurated and said how stupid Donald Trump was for criticizing the CIA and going to war with the CIA because, as Schumer put it, everybody in Washington knows you don't make yourself an enemy of establishment power because they have six different ways to Sunday to get back at you. And you look at Donald Trump's presidency and his post-presidency, and it's nothing but vindication of the warning that Schumer issued. And so people who are inside establishment halls of power, embedded within it, rising within it, know better than anybody
what they're capable of doing to their enemies. And so to purposely remove yourself from it and make yourself an enemy, as Daniel Ellsberg did, is extremely rare. It cuts against normal human instinct and self-preservation and self-interest. But he did it with his eyes wide open. Now, let me just walk you through very quickly what those establishment credentials were. Ellsberg went to Harvard. He graduated from Harvard. He was always regarded as somebody who was extremely intelligent, who was constantly told that. He succeeded easily in academic institutions. In the mid-1950s, he enlisted in the Marines. He spent several years in the Marines. He rose up the ranks quickly, and he left the Marines as a commissioned officer and a first lieutenant. He then went back to Harvard and got his PhD, and he studied nuclear policy and economics. And his ability to master the complexities and intricacies of nuclear theory and how the management of nuclear weapons made him one of the most sought after policy advisors in the middle of the Cold War. This is the late 1950s, the early 1960s, when nuclear war, unlike now, was on everybody's mind. People, kids were being routinely taught to how to hide in bomb shelters. The United States and the USSR came very close to ending the war through an exchange of nuclear weapons during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so people who were experts in the complexities of nuclear weapons doctrine, as Ellsberg was as a result of the PhD he got in Harvard and the connections that he made, were people who were very much in demand. And so by the time he was 35 years old, in the mid-1960s, he had gone to work for the RAND Corporation, which is a nonprofit think tank that has long been, especially during the Cold War, the closest advisor to the Department of Defense. He obtained a very high position within the RAND Corporation that required him to have access to the nation's most sensitive secrets. I remember him many times talking about how everybody hears the word top secret and thinks it's these incredibly sensitive documents. We're hearing that now. For example, in the case of the Trump indictment, we've heard that in the case of Julian Assange and Edward Snowden and Daniel Osberg. But he talked often about how many different levels of secrecy there are that are above the level of top secret, things that are categories, categories and classifications we don't even know about. And he had access to all of those. And as a member of the Rand Corporation advising the Kennedy administration and the Johnson administration on nuclear policy, he was an advocate early on of the Vietnam War. He believed in its just nature. In fact, he was not only an advocate of it, but a planner of it. He helped to execute its policies. And it was through that top secret access and beyond that he began to see the truth about the war in Vietnam. He saw it from the inside. Every incentive put upon him was to be an advocate of the Vietnam War. The path that was open to him at such a young age to obtain real power in the United States, I mean, really unlimited power, was wide open. And yet, the more he saw, the more cynical and skeptical he became. He began having access to and even participating in the preparation of reports in which top Pentagon officials top CIA officials, top White House officials, talking about the war in Vietnam, were saying the exact opposite of what they were telling the American public in order to convince Americans to support that war. The studies in which he participated and to which he had access, many of which became part of the Pentagon Papers that he leaked, said from the very first moment of the war that there was no way to win the war in Vietnam. There was no way to defeat Ho Chi Minh and to vanquish North Vietnamese communists because the jungles of Vietnam made it that the people who live in that country and who know that country would always be able to fight an insurgency that no B-52 planes or Agent Orange weapons could possibly end up defeating, that all we could do is hope to drag the war out long enough to have it be a stalemate. Sacrificing our own citizens as cannon fodder and destroying that country in the name of saving it. And you heard RFK Jr. when I asked him whether he views the Vietnam War similar to the war in U Iraq in the sense that it was an attempt essentially to spread democracy at the 
point of a rifle, as he described the war in Iraq, and he said, no, I don't. I actually see it as the opposite. The people of Vietnam supported Ho Chi Minh. They didn't support the South Vietnamese leader that we installed. He was viewed as an American puppet, as a French puppet, as a puppet of the West, which is exactly what he was. They had very little organic support, just like the people we wanted to install in Iraq after we removed Saddam Hussein, or the people we envisioned running Syria or Libya who have no organic support in those countries. They were very happy with the leadership of Ho Chi Minh, whether you agree with it or not. And the Pentagon planners knew that and talked about it constantly and yet lied directly to the faces of the American people constantly. And Daniel Ellsberg knew it because he had the access to this secret information. Just like Edward Snowden knew that James Clapper was lying when he went before the Senate in 2013 and denied that the NSA was collecting huge amounts of spying data on American citizens because Edward Snowden, through his access to classified documents, held in his hands the proof that they, he was lying. And Snowden, too, knew he was risking life in prison to reveal this information, but following in the footsteps of Danny Ellsberg, decided that he believed that the only ethical choice that he had, the only way he could live the rest of his life in peace, was to know that at the moment of truth, he wasn't intimidated and didn't back down from doing the thing that he knew was right, but instead revealed the secrets, these, the truth, to his fellow citizens in the United States. And that's exactly what Ellsberg did. Now, it's really worth remembering that we, of course, most people know that the war in Iraq was launched based on completely false pretenses, that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, and neocons like Bill Kristol, and the current editor-in-chief of The Atlantic, Jeffrey Goldberg, who back then was a war correspondent from The New Yorker, also purposely deceived Americans into believing that Saddam Hussein was behind the anthrax attacks and that he was in an alliance with Al-Qaeda because after 9-11, all Americans wanted was vengeance for the 9-11 attack and they needed to be convinced that Saddam Hussein was allies with those who perpetuated it and they were told that that was 9-11 and Saddam was an ally of Al-Qaeda, could risk giving his nuclear weapons. That, those were the lies that led to the Iraq war. The war in Vietnam was launched on exactly the same kind of false claims, namely a completely fabricated tale about alleged aggression by the North Vietnamese in the Gulf of Tonkin in 1964 that in turned out to be a total fabrication. And even the Naval Institute and other arms of the U.S. government now having reviewed mountains of classified uh, information have concluded that the claims that originally led to the war in v Vietnam that convinced the U.S. Senate to vote almost unanimously for authorization of military force to allow Lyndon Johnson to send combat troops to Vietnam, the Gulf of Tonkin incident was a complete fabrication, every bit as much as the lies that led to the war in Iraq. Ellsberg started realizing that and started realizing that the entire premise of the war in Vietnam, that they kept saying, we're just months away from winning, the next six months are crucial, all we need are more weapons, more budgetary authority, a few more thousand lives to sacrifice at the altar of this war. 58,000 American soldiers ended up being killed along with the millions of Vietnamese civilians. Just keep giving us a little bit more and within six months we're going to win when inside they knew that was a lie. They weren't wrong in their predictions or in their assessments. It wasn't a misjudgment. It was a lie. And Ellsberg, in his hands, had the proof that this war that was being prosecuted was being fueled. Every night he would turn on the news and hear on Walter Cronkite or the Nightly News or in the New York Times, or the Washington Post, American officials blatantly lying to the public. He had that in his hands. Imagine that you're in that position where you're reading the leaders of the United States tell your fellow citizens about the most important policy possible, the war in Vietnam. Things that you know are not only lies, but are things they know are lies. What do you do in that situation? Because on the one hand, you have the evidence in your hands that you can show the public to reveal the truth. But on the other hand, those documents have been designated top secret and therefore making it a crime to reveal them, a felony, precisely because American leaders wanted not to protect the national security of the United States or to protect American citizens, but protect themselves.
And the only way you could bring the truth to the attention of the public is by committing felonies that you know will make yourself an enemy of the establishment of which you're now a, a, a crucial part, deeply embedded within it, and likely to send you to prison for the rest of your life. You can say that's an easy decision, but for nobody it is, and for Ellsberg it wasn't. Now, Ellsberg tried to find a third way of having this information disclosed without having to go to prison for the rest of his life at the age of 35 or 40 in order to do it. First, he tried to convince senators to read the Pentagon Papers into the record on the Senate floor because members of the Senate or of Congress under the Constitution have full-scale immunity for any speeches they give on the floor of the Senate. So they could go to the floor of the Senate, read top-secret material, and be comfortable and secure in the fact that they could not be prosecuted for it. Edward Snowden wanted that to happen as well. Before he leaked those documents that have now caused him to be in exile for nine years and that would cause him to be in prison for 10 years rather and that would cause him to be in prison for life if he left Russia, there were members of the Senate like Ron Wyden and Mark Udall who kept hinting at the fact that they knew that the NSA was spying on Americans indiscriminately in ways that were illegal but they lacked the courage to disclose it even though they could have gone to the floor of the Senate and done so and been guaranteed they wouldn't be prosecuted, they left it to Edward Snowden to do and risk prison. That's exactly the same thing that happened to Daniel, Daniel Ellsberg. He tried to get senators to do it instead, knowing they had the protections that he lacked and they refused. And then he knew that the only way he could possibly get this into the hands of the public was to go to the media and give it to the media and in all likelihood end up exposed as the source of this material and be prosecuted. And that's exactly what happened. He provided it to the New York Times. In fact, what actually happened, and the New York Times admits this in their obituary today, was he originally told a reporter from the New York Times, Neil Sheehan, that he could come to Ellsberg's apartment and read those documents, but he was barred from copying them. That was the deal he struck with the New York Times reporter. And the New York Times reporter went to Ellsberg's apartment and broke that agreement. He made copies, started making copies without Ellsberg's knowledge or consent. He stole the documents from Ellsberg, basically, and then took it to the New York Times to be published, risking Ellsberg's liberty before he was willing to do it. But eventually Ellsberg decided that it should be published, and he authorized the New York Times to start publishing it. And when they did, the Nixon administration immediately came in, threatened New York Times editors and journalists with prosecution, not just Ellsberg, demanded they stop and then went to a federal court and got a order of prior restraint, the first ever issued in history against an American newspaper, ordering the New York Times to cease publication of the Pentagon Papers. But Ellsberg was so determined to get this into the hands of the, the American public that even seeing how extreme the government was being, how extreme the courts were being, he then started making other copies, sent it to the Washington Post, and they started publishing it, even though the New York Times had been enjoined. And when the Nixon administration then went to court to try and enjoin the Washington Post, the Washington Post won. So you had one judge imposing a prior restraint order on the New York Times, another judge rejecting it. So you had a conflict. The Supreme Court took it up. And in a 6-3 to three ruling in the United States versus Sullivan, the Pentagon Papers case, they ruled that it was a violation of the First Amendment to impose an order of prior restraint on a newspaper, except in the most extreme circumstances which were not present in that case. And that allowed the New York Times and the Washington Post to get on with the business of reporting these secrets. Now, the court, the Supreme Court, when they did that, went out of their way to say it's possible that the New York Times and the Washington Post and their editors are committing crimes by publishing these documents. We're not commenting on that. That's for another day. All we're saying is they cannot be censored in advance. It was a very important victory for press freedom because it essentially made prior restraint in the United States inherently unconstitutional under the First Amendment. That was something that was won as a result of Daniel Ellsberg's actions. Now, once Ellsberg leaked those papers, it was a gigantic scandal. The Nixon administration began panicking because obviously the war in Vietnam was extremely important to them. 
and they were desperately scared that the public would abandon their support for it once they saw the truth that they had been lied to. Obviously, Ellsberg was prosecuted, and I will get to that in a second, but the attacks on him went far beyond legal process. Almost immediately, top-level Nixon administration officials like Henry Kissinger and John Ehrlichman started publicly accusing Ellsberg of being a Kremlin agent. This is back in 1971. So we're talking about 50 years ago, 52 years ago. And that back then, the go-to tactic of the U.S. security state for all dissidents whose reputations they wanted to destroy was to accuse them of being agents of Moscow. Does that sound familiar? Of course it should, because that is still the go-to tactic for any dissidents of American foreign policy. Every day you get accused of being a Kremlin agent. That was the tactic used against Donald Trump. That is the tactic used against every skeptic of Russiagate and that lie that emanated from the U.S. security state. And of course, it's now the tactic used against anyone who opposes the U.S. proxy war in Ukraine. That was what was done to Daniel Ellsberg. He was an agent of the Soviet Union, a covert communist, because he wanted to show the truth to the American people about the U.S. government. But that's not all they did. This is incredible when you think about it. The Nixon administration at the highest levels authorized a break-in to the psychiatrist's office of Daniel Ellsberg in order to try and discover psychosexual secrets that would shame Ellsberg and undermine his reputation and credibility in the eyes of the American people. And I never, I remember when I was starting first to think about the Pentagon Papers report when I was a pre pre-adolescent and then a young teenager, I couldn't for the life of me understand why they thought that would work. Ellsberg comes forward and says, here are documents, tens of thousands of them, proving that the government is lying to you about the war in Vietnam and has been from the start. And the solution to the U.S. government, to the CIA, is to say, Danny Ellsberg is a pervert. Here's what you learn from his psychiatrist's office, or but obviously leak it through more covert means than that. It seemed like an ultimate, the ultimate non sequitur to me. But of course, I was naive then, and these people had been around Washington for decades. They knew very well how the game was played, and they know that if you can attach to your enemy any kind of sexual scandal, nothing is more effective at making people not want to hear anything about that person than that. Immediately when Julian Assange when he needed to be destroyed and they couldn't prosecute him, suddenly rape allegations materialized, sexual assault allegations materialized, the details of it were leaked about how these two women with whom he was having a consensual relationship asked him to use a condom and he refused. Just the details of the person's life in a sexual way is one of the most effective means of destroying their reputation. And that was what they tried to do to Dan Yalsberg. They broke into his psychiatrist's office and obtained his files. And they didn't find much dirt, and then they thought for sure it was at the home of the psychiatrist's office. And John Dean, the then White House counsel, who has now turned into a liberal commentator, always going on TV and saying, this is worse than Watergate. At the time, he was Nixon's White House counsel. He had approved that first break-in, or the Nixon White House did. And then he refused to approve the second one into the home of the psychiatrist's office. But that was the nature of the attack Salzburg was facing. And, of course, he then ended up getting prosecuted. He was charged under the Espionage Act of 1917, which is a statute we've covered many times. It's the one that they're using to try and prosecute Julian Assange. It's the one that they used to prosecute Edward Snowden. It was originally implemented under the Woodrow Wilson administration to criminalize dissent for those who oppose the involvement of the U.S. into the war in Europe, into World War I. And in fact, there were opponents of that war, mostly socialists, who were prosecuted under the Espionage Act of 1917 for doing nothing else than opposing the war in Vietnam, uh, in Europe, World War I, and they were accused of being agents of a foreign power. And that war, that statute largely lay dormant until the Justice Department used it to prosecute Ellsberg. But Ellsberg had admitted he was the Pentagon Papers leaker. He didn't want to hide. What he wanted to do was to use 
the time before the trial to give interviews and go on a campaign and convince Americans that what he did was just because they were being lied to about the war in Vietnam. And he really wanted to go on the stand and say to the jury of his peers, yes, I leaked these documents, but I didn't have criminal intent when I did so. I wasn't acting as a spy or for espionage. I was doing it because it was just, because these documents never should have been classified in the first place. And the minute he tried to do that, the minute he went on the stand and raised that defense, the judge intervened and shut him up multiple times and ruled that under the Espionage Act, it doesn't matter what your motive is. It's a strict liability criminal law, one of the few on the books. As long as the government can prove that you leave classified information, you are guilty under the Espionage Act. That's what makes it such a powerful weapon in the hands of the government. It basically assures, makes conviction inevitable. And one of the things I recounted in that Rolling Stone article was that Edwin Edward Snowden identified himself. He came forward. He never wanted to hide behind anonymity. He came forward in an interview I did with him in The Guardian in the first week on a, in video that Laura Poitras directed and filmed and said, yes, I'm the leaker. Here's why I did it. People like John Kerry and Hillary Clinton kept saying, oh, well, if Snowden really believes what he did was justified, he should, quote, man up. That was the words John Kerry used and come back home and tell a jury of his peers, make the case to them that what he did was correct. But they were lying. They knew that under the Espionage Act, as a result of the ruling in Ellsberg's case, you are not permitted, once you're charged with the Espionage Act, to go on the stand and make that case. That's why Julian Assange is so desperately fighting extradition to the United States because he knows under the Espionage Act his conviction is almost guaranteed. And it was Daniel Ellsberg's case that created that precedent. He want, that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to stand up and say, I did this. I'm proud of it. And I should be acquitted because I didn't have criminal motives. The real criminals were the people who tried to abuse the secrecy powers of the government to conceal their lives and their crimes. When Ellsberg turned himself in at the Boston Federal Courthouse in 1971, he gave a press conference, and we're going to show you just a small part of it, where uh, actually I think we need to pull this up. Um, we're going to pull this up and listen to the questions that he was asked and the answers he gave. It's a pretty short clip, but it's very illuminating. You've had charges now hanging over your head, so to speak, for some months, and now more serious charges. As time goes on and as you become more deeply entwined in this matter, have, have your feelings changed, or are they changing toward the, toward the entire case? Toward the case? Toward, toward the entire matter. I can't regret having done what I knew at the time to be what I ought to do, my duty as a citizen. Uh, I have no no way that I can regret that. You're not having any second thoughts about your action now, is that right? Oh, certainly not. Dr. Certainly Ellsberg, not. at a recent press conference, you said you were willing to accept any responsibility or anything that came for your part in the Pentagon Papers. The latest indictment says 115-year prison term and $120,000 fine for maximum. Are your thoughts still the same, that you're willing to accept any consequences? I have two thoughts about that. I go back to my earlier answer. Uh, how can you measure the jeopardy that I'm in, uh, whether it's 10 years, 20 years, 115 years, or other ludicrous uh, amounts like that, to the penalty that has been paid uh, already by 50,000 American families here and hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese families? It would be absolutely presumptuous of me to pity myself in that context, and I certainly don't, and I'd be ashamed of myself. You know, those are incredible words to hear, but his actions back that up. Now, I said at the start that he was most known for the Pentagon Papers case, understandably so. It was an amazing act of courage and conscience in which he engaged, but it was by far, far from the only uh, actions he took that were significant. In fact, when I interviewed Jeffrey Sachs, about a wide range of issues, he on several occasions mentioned the work of Daniel Ellsberg that had nothing to do with the Pentagon Papers case. Ellsberg wrote a book about the secrets of the American nuclear program, and he revealed the fact that the United States had all but decided when China in the late 1950s 
invaded and took hold of some small islands near the Chinese mainland, that the response of the United States government was going to be a first strike nuclear attack on China. We we're going to just nuke them. And only because they withdrew from those islands beforehand was the world saved from nuclear apocalypse. At the time that Ellsberg leaked this, this was in the late 2018, 2019, that, that, that those secrets were technically still top secret and he dared the government to come and arrest him. He said, I just did what Julian Assange did, why don't you come and arrest me? He also, the way I got to really work with him was we co-created the Freedom of the, Freedom of the Press Foundation along with Laura Poitras and other privacy activists that at the time was designed to break a extrajudicial blockade on WikiLeaks. Joe Lieberman and other high level officials inside the US government had pressured and threatened financial services companies like Amazon, MasterCard, Visa, the Bank of America to cut off WikiLeaks, to not let them raise funds anymore, even though they had never been charged with, let alone convicted of a crime. And so we formed the Freedom of the Press Foundation in order to circumvent that blockade, we said, if you want to donate Wiki, to WikiLeaks, donate to us and we will give them the money. We raised funds for them as a way of essentially trying to say the government is never going to be able to get away with destroying media outlets by putting pressure on large financial services companies to break the blockade. Ellsberg was the spirit and inspiration behind that group. He was the one who constantly urged us and encouraged us to confront any risk that came from that work, which were significant. And everything that he did as part of that group, we eventually became a much broader press freedom group. Defending journalists who did real journalism under attack was always motivated by that same spirit that led him to the Pentagon pap uh, Papers case. Now, again, the full story that, as I see it, is an art that article I wrote in Rolling Stone. I hope you read it. But just to conclude, before we talk to our guests, I wanted to show you some last words that Dan Yellsberg purposely wanted the public to hear, and he gave an interview to Politico on June 4th, so less than two weeks ago, as he knew he was dying, and the headline was, Dan Yellsberg is dying, and he has some final things to say. The iconic whistleblower reflects on the urgent need for others to follow in his footsteps. Now, one of the things that was so inspiring about Ellsberg was he always used his status and platform because even though he was very controversial at the beginning, the war in Vietnam has become to be seen by most Americans as a huge mistake or something immoral. And so his reputation got vindicated and improved over the years and he used it to become the most outspoken defender of people like Julian Assange and Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning and others saying that these people were heroes. <clears throat> he had waited decades for people like this to emerge that they acted in the same exact spirit and with the same heroism that drove him. And he used his fame and his popularity and his establishment credentials to defend new whistleblowers who followed in his footsteps, even knowing that they were also hated by the establishment. So here from the Politico article, quote, during the course of our hour and 20 minute interview, Ellsberg contended America still runs a quote, covert empire around the world embodied in the U.S. domination of NATO. He believes Washington deliberately provoked Vladimir Putin into invading Iraq, uh, invading Ukraine by pushing its seat of power eastward toward Russia's borders. That the mainstream media is, quote, complicit in allowing the government to keep secrets it has no right to withhold. And that any notion American, Americans are, quote, ever the good guys abroad, quote, has always been false. Quote, I think very few Americans are aware of what our actual influence in the former colonial world has been, and that is to keep it colonial, Ellsberg said. King Charles III of Britain is no longer an emperor, as I understand it, but for all practical purposes, Joe Biden is. Here's a point I haven't made to anyone but would like to make in my last few days here. Very simply, how, would, how many Americans would know any one of the following cases, let alone three or four of them? Ellsberg then rattles off a series of U.S. orchestrated coups, most of them fairly well documented, starting with Iran in 1953, and then Guatemala, Indonesia, Honduras, Dominica Republic, Brazil, and Chile. I responded by saying those were all Cold War policies, if covert ones, and ask him whether he thinks anything has changed since. 
in announcing the complete U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan in 2021, for example, as the Taliban, the Taliban effectively chased American troops out of the country, Biden declared that the United States was, quote, ending an era of major military operations to remake other countries. Ellsberg doesn't believe it. Quote, Democrats in this area are as shameless as Republicans, he said. Our elections in the realm of foreign policy and defense policy and arms sales, I have come to understand, are essentially between people vying to be manager of the empire. He was particularly concerned about the proxy war in Ukraine, having spent so much of his adult life studying the dangers of nuclear weapons, and was adamant that that war was an extremely dangerous and foolish endeavor where we're risking nuclear annihilation over something that is simply not in the interest of the American people. He chose to spend the last days of his life trying to sound these warnings about the same dangers, the same concerns, the same corruption that he spent his entire adult life combating to the point of being willing to go to prison for life in order to back up not just those words, but with actions. And for that reason, and so many others, I regard Danny Ellsberg as one of the real heroes of recent American history, an absolutely extraordinary figure from which I have learned so much. And I believe everyone can learn so much by thinking about and studying and reviewing not just the actions he took, but the reasons that he took them. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update. Catch our full shows for free, live weekdays at 7 p.m. Eastern on Rumble, and join our Locals community at greenwall.locals.com for all of my written journalism, exclusive after-show Q&As, and more.